guys, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to my discussion video for March's chapters of Our Mutual Friend. If you don't know, which you probably do by now or you wouldn't be watching this video, I am currently hosting a Victorian style serialised read along of Charles Dickens' Our Mutual Friend where I read a few chapters every month just as the Victorians would have done at the time. This read along has been going on since May of last year and will finish in November of this year. So this month, in the month of March, and bear in mind it is still the month of March, look at how impressively on the timing I am this month. In the month of March we read the first four chapters of Book the Third, A Long Lane. Chapter One, Lodgers in Queer Street. Chapter Two, A Respected Friend in a New Aspect. Chapter Three, The Same Respected Friend in More Aspects Than One. And Chapter Four, A Happy Return of the Day. So yes, let's discuss those four great chapters. Let us talk about Chapter One, Lodgers in Queer Street. So in this chapter we first encounter Mr Raya and Mr Fledgeby. Fascination of Fledgeby is as anti-Semitic, racist and just generally awful as always and Mr Raya is just as angelic and lovely as always. Mr Lamley turns up and tells Fledgeby that their game's up and that their plan to marry Fledgeby off to Georgiana Podsnap has all gone wrong and is now off because Mr Podsnap has broken with Mr Lamley and Mrs Lamley. So in this chapter we are kind of getting the resolution of book two, we're finding out exactly what the climaxes of book two meant for the characters and we find that out here and then we also find that out shortly after when Fascination Fledgeby turns to Mr Raya and says where is she? He knows that Mr Raya has in some way helped Lizzie escape and get away and we now find out what's happened with Lizzie's disappearance, we know that Mr Raya helped her engineer it and we know that she has been placed at a safe distance and is away from both Eugene and Bradley and it's quite significant and interesting I think that the way Mr Raya describes it is not just that she's run away from Bradley Headstone, it's that she's also run away from Bradley Headstone and Eugene Jean Rayburn and that's quite important. Just to talk about a few things of interest in this chapter, I do think it's always worth taking a moment to pause and examine the character of Mr Raya and Dickens's presentation of him. I think Mr Raya is a really fascinating character. I've spoken before about how Mr Raya acts as one of Dickens's male angels. There are a lot of female angels in Dickens novels and in a lot of Victorian novels. The idea of this angel in the house, often for Dickens his female angels go far beyond the idea of an angel in a house. It's not just an idea of domesticity, there's a lot else bound up in there as well. But he does have a few male angels in his books. So for example Tom Pinch in Martin Chuzzlewit or to an extent Joe Gardry in Great Expectations and Mr Raya in Our Mutual Friend are male angel figures as well. They're male symbols of morality whereas for the most part in Dickens's novels his symbols of morality are women, people like Lizzie Hexham. But it is interesting how Mr Raya acts as a symbol of morality. I've spoken as well before about how Mr Raya is in many ways for Dickens I think very strongly an apology for Fagin. Fagin in Oliver Twist is a Jewish man and is just presented atrociously, like it's just very very anti-semitic and quite nasty to read. And Dickens actually received quite a lot of complaints at the time. The second half of the serialised version of Oliver Twist actually had a lot less references to Fagin's Jewishness because he had received complaints. There's an interesting story about how Dickens sold his house to a Jewish couple and that the wife told him that she had read lots of his books that she found his portrayal of Fagin like not only horrible but also really damaging because a writer like Dickens has a lot of influence and it's not just about the fact that Dickens was being anti-Semitic, it's also the fact that he was spreading those kind of values and apparently this conversation had a massive impact on Dickens and that's part of where Mr Raya comes from as an apology for Fagin. What's to an extent problematic is that Mr Raya is still a symbol for Dickens. I don't know how problematic it is because in a way all of Dickens' characters are symbols, like often, very often, his characters are representative of people beyond themselves. If you look at someone like Mr Podstap, Mr Podstap is representative of a lot of people like him in society. So is Fascination Fledgeby. If you look at the end of this chapter, the way Dickens describes him, the murky fog closed about him and shut him up in its sooty embrace. If it had never let him out any more, the world would have had no irreparable loss, but could have easily replaced him from its stock on hand. And I think there are two interesting things in that sentence about Fascination Fledgeby being swallowed up by the fog. One is Dickens saying that this man is worth so little that he could easily be replaced, but the other thing that he's saying is he could very easily be replaced because there are a lot of people like him. So Fascination Fledgeby stands for one of many, as do so many characters in Dickens, but as does Mr Raya. I think it's really interesting how, in the same way that for Dickens and Oliver Twist, Fagin's Jewishness is bound up with his being evil. In uh, Our Mutual Friend, Mr Raya being Jewish is definitely bound up with his being good. But I think it is more complicated than just Dickens trying to apologise for Fagin and therefore presenting someone who is Jewish and also innately moral and good. I think it's also for Dickens to do with someone who has been persecuted and has been misjudged 
helping and caring for other people who have been persecuted and misjudged. And I think that is what Tri Dickens is trying to do, which is more interesting and nicer. I think that's what he's trying to do when he talks about the way that Mr. Ryer cares for Lizzie. So when Mr. Ryer says to Fledgeby, Sir, I have no motive but to help the helpless, you do get the feeling that part of the reason why Mr. Ryer wants to help Lizzie, partly it's because he's a good person and because he cares about her, but it's also partly because everyone is horrible to him. Like, everyone is awful to him. And he knows what it feels like to be persecuted and to have a horrible life and so he wants to help her. And I think that is really interesting and really good and does give Mr. Raya a bit more character and a bit more personality than just being this kind of male angel figure slash apology for Fagin. Because I do think he is more than just an apology for Fagin. But sometimes Dickens almost forgets that his character that he has created is more than an apology for Fagin. But anyway, moving on from that, I do quickly want to talk about Fascination with Fledgeby because I think he's a really interesting character. And there are two really interesting things that Dickens does here with Fascination of Fledgeby. One is that in the same way that he makes Mr. Raya stand for the way that Jewish people are treated throughout Victorian society, he also makes Mr. Fledgeby stand for the way that people treat Jewish people throughout Victorian society. And some of the things that Fledgeby says are just atrocious. Jews and generosity, that's a good connection. Bring out your vouchers and don't talk Jerusalem, Pamela. Like, so much of the stuff he says is just horrible. And because Fascination Fledgeby is shown to be completely horrible in everything he does and not just this. Like the main things we see of Fledgeby are him being horrible and awful and scheming to everybody and him being really racist to Mr. Raya. And I think Dickens does this quite cleverly in order to kind of emphasise just how awful Fascination Fledgeby's anti-Semitism is because he is awful as a whole. The other thing that is interesting about Fledgeby, which you get quite a lot in Dickens, is that Fledgeby is a horrible horrible, despicable human being, but he's also quite funny and Dickens makes us laugh at him to kind of lessen the power of this evil man and I think that is done quite well and I do like it when Dickens does that, I think it's very effective. One of the, my favourite bits in this chapter which made me laugh aloud is when Lamley's left the room and Mr Fledgeby is sat there. You have a pair of whiskers, Mr Lamley, which I never liked, murmured Fledgeby, and which money can't produce. You are boastful of your manners and your conversation. You wanted to pull my nose and you have let me in for a failure and your wife says I am the cause of it. I'll bowl you down, I will, though I have no whiskers. Here he rubbed the place where they were due, and no manners, and no conversation. And it just makes me laugh that, like, Fledgeby has so many reasons to hate Mr Lamley, but one of his main reasons is that Mr Lamley has a beard and he can't grow one, and that does kind of make me laugh. On to book three, chapter two, a respected friend in a new aspect. In this chapter, we encounter again Jenny Wren and Mr. Raya. Mr. Raya and Jenny Wren meet each other, they have quite a nice kind of playful conversation and we see a lot more of their relationship and his kind of fatherly feeling towards her, which is especially important because her father is an alcoholic who doesn't care for her at all, but who she has so far stopped thinking of him as a father that she refers to him as her child. But Mr. Raya kind of takes on this father or mother figure in a way. Mr. Raya and Jenny Wren go walking across London and they turn up at the Six Jolly Fellowship Porter's pub which Miss Abby Potter runs. Mr. Raya and Jenny encounter Miss Abby who is rather taken with Jenny. They show Miss Abby the proof that they have from Riderhood through Rokesmith, though they don't know that, and then through Lizzie, that Lizzie's father was innocent of the crimes. Um, and they show that to Miss Abby so that she knows that as well. Then at the end of the chapter there's a lot of commotion. I think, I think that's what they say is a steamer has knocked someone off their ship but I'm not completely clear about that. I think that's what's supposed to have happened and then they bring in the body of the man who is nearly drowned and it is Riderhood. So things of interest in this chapter. One thing I think is really interesting is the relationship between Jenny and Mr. Raya. It's really nice to see something more of them and I quite like their playful conversation and the way that kind of fairy tale links into so many aspects of this book. I can't remember if it's mentioned earlier or if it's mentioned later. I think it's about the time we meet Jenny Wren that it says her real name is not Jenny Wren, her name is Fanny Cleaver. She changes her name to Jenny Wren because it's more like a fairy tale and she kind of wants to live in a fairy tale and so I like the way that she calls Mr. Raya godmother and he calls her Cinderella and I think that's quite fun. Another thing that is really interesting Interesting about this is it's quite interesting to see how Dickens's male angel figures are often presented in kind of typically feminine terms. Obviously it's quite overt here and that she literally calls him godmother but I think you can see the same in the way that Dickens describes Joe Gardry in Great Expectations or Tom Pinch in Martin Chuzzlewit. It's interesting that for him, for men to be kind of angelic and really really moral they also have to be slightly in his terms, slightly feminine and it's partly I think because for Dickens as for quite a lot of Victorians morality is innately kind of female. I could, I've talked about this quite a bit and I'll talk about this a lot more as we go later through the book because I think Lizzie throughout this novel is quite an interesting kind of beacon of morality 
and it's very important that she is a female beacon of morality for Dickens. But I do think that when it's interesting that when you do get these kind of male beacons of morality, Dickens often describes them in slightly more feminine language. Another thing I think is quite interesting, just a quick line, but we do get to find out quite a bit more about Mr. Riot in this chapter, where he says, some beloved companionships fades out of most lives, my dear. That of a wife and a fair daughter and a son of promise has faded out of my own, but the happiness was. And this sentence is really interesting for two reasons. One, because we find out a lot more about Mr. Raya and we find out more about his life and also part of his kind of parental feeling towards Lizzie and towards Jenny because his two children are dead, or so it's certainly implied. And because he's lost a wife and two children and he therefore kind of adopts Jenny and Lizzie as his children in a way. One thing that is really interesting throughout a lot of Dickens novels is the way he looks at kind of surrogate parent figures. I think I've mentioned before how in Dickens there aren't very many like positive examples of biological parents. Like one of the only positive parental relationships that Dickens deals with is that relationship between Bella Wilfer and her father. But even then he kind of plays with that by using language to imply that Bella acts more as a parent to him than he does to her. But in his novels he explores a lot the idea of surrogate parent figures and Mr. Raya is a far 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 better parental figure to Jenny than her own father is and I think that is really interestingly explored and obviously Lizzie um, both her parents are dead by this point so Mr. Rye can act as a kind of father and mother figure towards her. The other thing that's interesting in that sentence though is that of a wife and a fair daughter and a son of promise. Look at the gendering in that sentence and I don't think this is anything to do with Mr. Rye. I don't think this is like Dickens saying anything about Mr. Raya. I think this is very telling of Dickens's view and all of society's view in the Victorian period. What do you remember about your daughter who's dead? That she was beautiful. What do you remember about your son that was dead? That he had lots of promise to do great things in life. What do you remember about your daughter? What she looked like? What do you remember about your son? What he did or was going to do? Anyway, another thing I really like in this chapter is when Jenny Wren passes the shop where all of the toys have her dresses. I think that's kind of lovely because I mentioned before how Jenny Wren is one of my favourite characters and one of the things I really like about her is how important her work is to her because I think that's really nice and it's lovely to see in Dickens a very, very positive presentation of female industry and of a woman working but also to see a positive presentation of a woman working who is working for herself more than she is working for anybody else because that's quite rare until this point in Dickens's career until this his last novel. As they were going along Jenny twisted her venerable friend aside to a brilliantly lighted toy shop window and said now look at him all my work. This referred to a dazzling semicircle of dolls in all the colours of the rainbow who were dressed for presentation at court, for going to balls, for going out driving, for going out on horseback, for going out walking, for going to get married, for going to help other dolls get married, for all the gay events of life. Pretty, 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 said the old man with a clap of his hand. Most elegant taste. Glad you like him, returned Miss Wren loftily. And I think that's just a really fun passage because it shows how important that her work is to Jenny and how proud she is of it. But also Dickens describes it in like impressive language, like it is genuinely quite beautiful and quite impressive. And all from this girl who is young, who is still a child. And I think that's just really beautiful and done very, very well. I also love how she talks about going to try on her doll's dresses. I just think it's the most glorious language. Look here, there's a drawing room or a grand day in the park or a show or a fete or what you like. Very well. I squeeze amongst the crowd and look about me. When I see a great lady very suitable for my business, I say, you'll do, my dear. And I take particular notice of her and run home and cut her out and baste her. <laughs> I love that she bases all her dolls and dolls' dresses on real people that she sees when she's out about. I think that's really fun and very kind of typical of Jenny as a kind of eccentric but wonderful character. When they go on to see Miss Abby at the six jolly fellowship porters, yes, that is what it's called, then we have this interesting quick conversation between Miss Abby and Mr. Raya, in which she asks him about Jenny, and she says, child or woman? Child in years, was the answer. Woman in self-reliance and trial. I think this is interesting in two respects. One, it gives us a bit of a sure idea of just how old Jenny is, because child in years for the Victorian period probably means she's less than 16. In my head, she's probably about 14, 15, but she could be slightly younger than that. We don't really know. But then it's also interesting that he says, woman in self-reliance and trial. And it's quite nice that what defines a woman as opposed to a child for him is self-reliance so that's kind of a nice interesting gender thing there but also I think it shows like Jenny is such an interesting character because in many ways she is a womanish child and Dickens does quite interesting things both with gender and also with like age there in that she feels so much more mature than a lot of like the other characters she encounters and it makes her very independent and very kind of exciting and wonderful to read about and like I said she's 
she's quite possibly my favourite character in all of literature. Bradley Headstone is probably the character in all of literature I find the most interesting, but Jenny Red is probably my favourite. I love her a great deal. I really like Miss Abby as well, actually. I think she's really nice and I like the way she talks about Lizzie. I think she is a very kind of strong and interesting character in her own right as well. It proves, which didn't need much proving, that Rogue Riderhood is a villain. I have had my doubts whether he is not the villain who solely did the deed, but I have no expectation of those doubts ever being cleared up now. I believe I did Lizzie's father wrong, but never Lizzie's self. Because when things were at the worst, I trusted her. She will find a home at the Porters and a friend at the Porters. I just think she's a very interesting character and for all that she is gruff, she is also kind and that is quite effective. I think she's a really interesting character and yeah, I wish I'd thought about her more. When I wrote my dissertation on gender and Dickens and I went on a lot about our mutual friend, I don't think I mentioned Miss Abby Potterson once and that is a real shame because she is great. And then of course at the end of the chapter, Mr Riderhood gets brought in nearly drowned. Which leads us on very nicely to the next chapter. Book three, chapter three, the same respected friend in more aspects than one. So what happens in this chapter is quite simple and it's not a very long chapter, so I don't think I'll spend too long on it. Basically, Mr. Riderhood is brought in having been nearly drowned and the company try to bring him back to life. What I think is really interesting, what Dickens explores quite well is that when Riderhood is nearly dead, when he is kind of hovering between life and death, suddenly everyone who hates him kind of cares about him more because it's just a person struggling for their life and so of course they have to help them. This gives Riderhood's daughter Pleasant this kind of momentary hope that things could be better but then of course the moment he recovers and kind of splutters back into life everybody remembers that they hate him and he is just horrible to everyone even though they've saved his life he's really annoyed that they didn't save his hat. The substance of this chapter in a way is kind of proving the humanity of everyone else in this pub that when a dying man is brought in they try to help him and also proving that Riderhood is just inherently and forever bad. Even this brush with death doesn't change him at all it's basically kind of cementing his character as a villain. So things of interest in this chapter. One thing which I'd forgotten about is that this chapter is in the present tense. And this is really interesting, especially because it goes straight after. It leads on directly from another chapter that is in the same place that's in the past tense, but now you move into the present tense. Effectively, for no other reason I can see them for the kind of dramatic tension of it. And I think that's quite powerful and quite effective, and I'd forgotten that this chapter was in the present tense. Another thing, I just, I love Dickens's writing in this chapter. I think it's just beautiful. I'm just going to read you two passages. I don't think I have much like to say about them, but I think they're great, so I'm going to read them. No one has the least regard for the man. With them all, he has been an object of avoidance avoidance, suspicion and aversion, but the spark of life within him is curiously separable from himself now and they have a deep interest in it, probably because it is life and they are living and must die. If you are not gone for good, Mr Riderhood, it would be something to know where you are hiding at present. This flabby lump of mortality that we work so hard at with such perseverance yields no sign of you. If you are gone for good, rogue, it is very solemn, and if you are coming back it is hardly less so. I just think Dickens is such a great writer. I really, really do. I've been thinking this a lot. I've been reading Elizabeth Gaskell, and I love Elizabeth Gaskell. She's probably my third favourite novelist after Charles Dickens and Jane Austen. But I think I love her novels more than I love her writing. If you gave me like a random paragraph of Gaskell, I don't think I'd find it particularly exciting, though I find her books incredible and brilliant and beautifully, wonderfully done. But Dickens, like, every sentence, I'm like, oh, that's a good sentence. Because I just think he writes so brilliantly. His writing style is just what I love. It's so odd and adventurous and eccentric, and I love it. And it's also quite modern. Like if you look at the passage where Riderhood is kind of coming awake and the way that Dickens uses like paragraphs and line spacing. So for example if you look at like the way he uses space here I think it's really interesting holding up this book like this I see I have quite a lot of tea stains on the front. Anyway. Stay. Did that eyelid tremble? So the doctor breathing low and closely watching asked himself. No. Did that nostril twitch? No. This artificial respiration ceasing. Do I feel any faint flutter under my hand upon the chest? No. Over and over again, no, no, but try over and over again, nevertheless. See a token of life, an indubitable token of life. Like, there's something so interesting and so almost modern about the way Dickens writes in passages like this where he doesn't write in full sentences, which I think is something we often forget that the Victorians did. For the moment I'm writing a historical novel set in the Victorian period and I'm trying to write it in a very like Victorian style and every now and then I write something I'm like, no, that's too modern for the Victorians. And then I read Dickens and I'm like, no. No, the Victorians did all kinds of fascinating things with language. They didn't just write in like plain full sentences. They played with language a lot. And that's what I love about Dickens, where he plays with language and with voice. Like, who is speaking there? Is it kind of the doctor? Is it kind of everyone in the room, their kind of united voice? Or is it just kind of Dickens as the author? Like, it's just so, it's so great. It's so great. 
that's all I have to say. I think the end of this chapter is really interesting because, like I mentioned, when Riderhood wakes up, he basically cements himself as a villain, like, even a brush with death this much cannot make him a better man. His two thoughts on waking up is one, that he wants to sue the steamer who has nearly drowned him, and also that he's lost his fur cap and he's really annoyed that no one picked it up in the river, not remotely grateful for the fact they saved his life. Like, the main purpose of this scene, the main purpose of Riderhood's near-death experience is to cement him as a villain who cannot be made good, who no event can make good. But I think there is kind of another purpose to this scene to do with the way that Riderhood perceives his own mortality, which I'll talk about a little bit later in book four, because it's not really relevant here. But I think the main purpose in this bit is to just show that Riderhood is a bad person and that no amount of near-death experiences or anything like that can make him a better one. Moving on to book three, chapter four, A Happy Return of the Day. A very ironically happy return. So in this chapter, basically, we have a dinner party at the Wilfers household to celebrate the wedding anniversary of Mr. Wilfer and Mrs. Wilfer, neither of which, especially Mrs. Wilfer, seem terribly happy that they did get married all these years ago. And Bella Wilfer comes home for this to spend the day with her parents and with her sister Lavinia and also with Lavinia's sweetheart, who used to be her sweetheart, George Sampson. Bella says that she's going to cook in order to prove to them all that she is not so above them. But she then doesn't cook everything and everything is kind of terribly badly cooked and somewhat raw, which on the one hand isn't great for the food, but on the other hand is really great for gender. I'll talk about that in a minute. They have a lot of kind of miserable discussions in which Mrs. Wilfer basically talks at length at the dinner table for the party of her wedding anniversary about how she should have married a better person who wasn't so short. And then Bella and her father have a nice chat at the end of it in which Bella tells him, one, that Mr. Rokesmith has proposed to her, also that she thinks Mr. Lighthood would if she would let him, and also that she is just as bad and mercenary as ever, and also that Mr. Boffin, worst of all, is becoming more mercenary. So yes, book three is going to be an interesting one. Things of interest in this chapter. First, I want to talk about the relationship between Mrs. Wilfer and Mr. Wilfer. As I think I've mentioned before, in Dickens there are very, very few happy marriages. Interesting how this is the same for Jane Austen as well. In both Jane Austen and Dickens, there are very few happily married couples who have been married for a long time. There are lots of happy weddings, lots of happy couples who marry and then the book ends, but there are very few actual happy marriages. In Dickens, it's basically just the Cratchits in A Christmas Carol and Mr. and Mrs. Boffin in Our Mutual Friend. That's basically it. I genuinely cannot think of another happily married couple who have been married for more than like a year presented in a Dickens novel. It just doesn't happen. Mr. and Mrs. Wilfer's unhappy marriage is very interesting. It's one of those marriages, like Mr. and Mrs. Bennet in Pride and Prejudice, that is hilarious until you suddenly realise how atrociously sad it is. It's so miserable. It's really miserable. They're both really unhappy and she's just horrible to him and he just like sits there and's like, well, I know you don't love me and you wish you married someone taller. He blends humour and misery so wonderfully, so wonderfully. The noble lady's condition on these delightful occasions was one compounded of heroic endurance and heroic forgiveness. Lurid indications of the better marriages she might have made shone athwart the awful gloom of her composure and fitfully revealed the cherub as a little monster unaccountably favoured by heaven who possessed himself of a blessing for which many of his superiors had sued and contended in vain. As for the children of the Union, their experience at these festivals had been sufficiently uncomfortable to lead them annually to wish, when out of their tenderest years, either that Ma had married somebody else instead of the much-teased Pa, or that Pa had married somebody else instead of Ma. When there came to be but two sisters left at home, the daring mind of Bella on one of these occasions scaled the height of wondering, with droll vexation, what on earth Pa could have ever seen in Ma to induce him to make such a little fool of himself as to ask her to have him. And then this is one of my favourite passages in this chapter. Look at Ma, whispered Lavinia to Bella when this was done, and they stood over the roasting fowls. If one was the most dutiful child in existence, of course, on the whole one hopes one is, isn't she enough to make one want to poke her with something wooden sitting there bolt upright in the corner? Well, Ma, returned Lally, since you will force it out of me, I must respectfully take leave to say that your family are no doubt under the greatest obligations to you for having an annual toothache on your wedding day, and that it's very disinterested in you and an immense blessing on them. Still, on the whole, it is possible to be too boastful even of that 
happen. Upon which Mrs. Wilford calls her an incarnation of sauciness. And one of the things that is the funniest and most sad in this chapter is when Mrs. Wilford is describing how her parents told her to marry somebody tall and never to marry a small man. I think I find this especially funny because I'm really short and I come from a family of very short people. I well remember Mama's clasping her hands and exclaiming, this will end in a little man. She afterwards went so far as to predict that it would end in a little man whose mind was well below the average. Within a month, said Mrs. Wilford, deepening her voice as if she were relating a terrible ghost story. Within a month, I first saw R.W., my husband. Within a year, I married him. It is natural for the mind to recall these dark coincidences on the present day. As I said, it's one of those things in Dickens which is incredibly funny until you remember how really sad it is. The other thing of interest in this chapter I want to discuss is Bella and the cooking. Bella, in an effort to show her parents that she is not so bad as they think and that she is not so high and mighty as they think, says, I mean to be cooked today. And then she is really bad at cooking. I do find it absolutely hilarious when her father cuts the chicken and she says, but what makes them pink inside, I wonder? Pa, is it the breed? No, I don't think that it's the breed, my dear, returned Pa. I rather think it is because they are not done. And I just love this because obviously Bella is in very many ways not an angel in the house figure. She doesn't really do anything that's angel in the house like, aside from all of her mercenary selfishness and her kind of spoilt nature. It's also great that she can't cook because it makes me really happy because I don't think Dickens has ever had a heroine before that can't cook. In general in Dickens, most of his heroines, even when they are independent, even when they are clever, even when they're intelligent, even when they have a job and work, they're also really domestic. And Bella is just so undomestic and just can't cook. And I think that's kind of fantastic and it makes me really happy. It also is kind of really interesting in terms of gender roles that when Bella fails and doesn't cook the meat and it all goes wrong, the person who takes over and finishes cooking the meal and sorts it out for her is her father, not her mother. And I do think that is really important and interesting in terms of gender roles as well. Now here's an interesting thought. I wonder, it's just occurred to me as I talk, as this often does. This always happens when I film this video as I find I have so much more than I thought I had to say. I wonder if you can look at RW, Mr. Wilfer, Bella's father, as a kind of male angel figure as well. Obviously Dickens often talks about him as a cherub and in many ways he kind of presents him as a less sophisticated model of morality than someone, for example, like Mr. Raya. Like he's not the same kind of character as Mr. Raya, but he is presented in many ways in this kind of angelic light in that Dickens talks about him as being a cherub and he's very kind of good natured and despite the fact that his wife is just horrible to him he kind of just goes with it in order to try and keep the peace in a very sad way but he's presented as this kind of figure of morality and kindness maybe kindness more than morality I think he's presented as this figure of kindness in a really interesting way perhaps it's also interesting then that for Dickens, in the same way that many of his male angel figures are presented in kind of typically feminine terms, he presents R.W. either in kind of typically feminine terms or in kind of typically boyish terms, like childish terms. It's really interesting to look at the way that for Dickens, being this kind of male angel figure, this version of moral masculinity can't be tied up with like traditional masculinity. It has to be either a kind of feminine masculinity or a kind of childish masculinity. Anyway, masculinity, what a fascinating thing in Dickens. Let us move on to the very end of the chapter, which I want to close this video on. And that is when Bella tells her father that Mr. Boffin is changing. She says, Mr. Boffin is being spoilt by posterity and is changing every day. Before my eyes, he grows suspicious, capricious, hard, tyrannical, unjust. If ever a good man were ruined by good fortune, it is my benefactor. And yet, Pa, think how terrible the fascination of money is. I see this and hate this and dread this and don't know but that money might make a much worse change in me. And yet I have money always in my thoughts and my desires. And the whole life I place before myself is money, 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 and what money can make of life. Money, I think, is in many ways the main theme in Our Mutual Friend. Like, that at the heart is what this book is about. It's about money and the, what money does to people and how people react towards money and that I think is really really interesting. Very interesting to hear two things about that speech. One is Bella's kind of continual need for money and the fact that even when she sees the dangers of money and what a bad effect it can have because she's not stupid she's an intelligent person and she sees the danger but she still wants to be really rich because she can see how it can change life and cares more about the life she can lead than she does about the kind of person she is but yet she's very aware. And that's what I think is really interesting about Bella. One of the things I really like about her is she's very self-conscious and she's very self-aware for all that she is very, very mercenary. She knows she's very mercenary and this kind of makes it 
more forgivable. I think it makes her a more likable character because it shows partly her intelligence, but also it shows like her awareness of herself and her kind of self critique, which I think is very, very interesting and makes her quite a complicated character. But also it's very interesting to, to see her talk about how Mr. Boffin is changing because in the first half of this book, we see Mr. Boffin as all good and all kind. He, a bit like Bella's father in a way is presented as this kind of embodiment of kindness like he is a completely good person and then we hear now that he might not be entirely good and this is very interesting and sets us up for an important theme throughout the rest of Our Mutual Friend. So yes that's basically all I wanted to say about March's chapters of Our Mutual Friend. In the month of April we will be reading book three chapter five The Golden Dustman Falls Into Bad Company. Chapter six The Golden Dustman Falls Into Worse Company. Chapter 7. The friendly move takes up a strong position. I am most excited for the rest of this book. I hope you are all enjoying Our Mutual Friend and that you enjoyed the chapters we read in March. Please let me know down in the comments how you enjoyed them or what you thought of them, etc. And I'll be back very soon with another bookish video.